identified four victims and plan on more than just the four murder charges filed today. So on our last episode, we brought you through the origin story of Mr. John Wayne Gacy and what makes a serial killer in this case. Um, we discussed his family life. Uh, we, we discussed what left, uh, led up to his first murder, which we covered in the last episode at the very end. And some of the reasons why him being picked on as a teenager um, basically got him the tendencies uh, you know, uh, to, to lash out against other teenager boys and then thus cause murder, uh, a lot of it having to do with his dad. Uh, plus creating another persona, whereas he worked all week, that is, at a contracting company that he owned, hiring uh, a lot of you know, uh, teenagers and uh, men under the age of 22 and uh, during the week. And then as a part-time clown, he performed at birthdays, kids' parties, and he had a sinister look to his clown. I don't know if you guys have seen it yet on our page, but I posted pictures, or you can just Google uh, John Wayne Gacy, the clown, and uh, you'll see some, how. Ooh, I haven't seen it. I hate clowns. Yeah, you, if you if you look at the couple pictures I posted, you, I don't know if you'd want to hire a kid back or hire a clown back then, let alone today, looking like him. Uh, that's all. Does it look like Pennywise? Uh, th- you know what? They did take parts of him and use him as Pennywise uh, for for the movies. That is true, um, but he does look very sinister because you could just tell the way he did his makeup. Mm-hmm. It's not a regular clown. You know who he looked like? <clears throat> the clown from Pee Wee Herman. A little bit, yeah, yeah. Because Pee Wee, if you remember, Pee Wee was a little out there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, his stuff wasn't exactly on point either. So, mm-hmm. but I know he there wasn't killing. No me. way, this freaking clown made any kid happy. <laughs> I know it. He's so creepy. Yeah, dude. And he's a big dude too. He's you know he's not like. He's husky and he's he's tall, so that's a huge clown. Yeah, dude. Um, yeah. Yeah, if if he showed up to my kid's party, yeah, man, go back. <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> what I haven't started? Nope. <laughs> I don't think he would sound like that. That'd be funny if he sounded like that, though. <laughs> I'll make a balloon. <laughs> nope. <laughs> so let's let's get started into uh, here in episode two. Uh, we last left off when John murdered his first victim in 1974. Uh, young Timothy, who was at the bus stop, who was 16 years old, mm-hmm. <clears throat> he now at this time resides under um, the, the crawl space of John Wayne Gacy's house. So he's been buried. Mm-hmm. Um, later that year in 1974, his second victim was claimed a white male between the ages of 14 and 18. Now, you might be asking yourself, why is Todd describing this victim without a name? It's because still to this day, this case is still active in the Chicago area because... Are you serious? Yes, there are six victims yet to be identified. From wow. Them. And this is one of them. This is number two. Um, it is not uh, It is not, sh- not clear how this boy and, uh, you know, suffered his fate other than the fact that, uh, that his M.O. Um, being John's probably played into this one. As we'll get, as you know, just to refresh people, is that he would get, um, he would, well, let's just talk about that for right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Remember the clown outfit that we talked about from Pogo that we, we got about his persona? Mm-hmm. Well, well, when these boys would go to his house now that his wife and his stepdaughters are gone from the house after the divorce, he had free reign to bring these kids home, offer them booze, weed, whatever, to kick it with them. He wanted to be that mm-hmm. cool guy, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, well, he would often say, "Hey, man, let's uh, let's go. Uh, you know, on the weekends, you know, I got to show you what I do on the weekends. I'm a clown." And he would bring these these kids home. He would dress up like Pogo and even put on the makeup sometimes. Mm. And here and here's how they think that they got his how he got his second uh, victim um, and the un- unidentified because this is what he would later say he would do to a lot of a lot of them. Okay. He, would, he would say, hey, you want to see a cool trick? It's a handcuff trick. And he would put himself in handcuffs. He would show the kids, like, like hey, check this out. The, the handcuffs are real. They're like the police ones. And he would put his hands behind his back. He would do the whole thing. And then he would do, like, this magic trick or whatever and pop out of them. So then 
Pogo would go to the boy and be like, here, here, you want me to show you how to do the trick? And he'd put the handcuffs on the kids. Yet they didn't know how to release those those handcuffs. So he mm. already, yeah, he got them where he wanted them. And uh, so once this happened, uh, you know, Pogo would either hit him over the head, uh, push him down into a prone situation, get him undressed, uh, you know, shackle their feet, whatever. And then um, he would often uh, to begin to bite the kids or the, the really? boys. Yeah. Pushing the head down in a, a prone situation to where he could then punch him in the ribs, stab him at times. Um, oh, man. Pull hair. Uh, shove object uh, objects into the rectum. Um, what? Yeah, yeah. He he went that far. And there's var- <clears throat> various other ways of torture using um, uh, knives, other things. Uh, just he fed off of their t- or off of their torture. And then the coup de gras. Well, not the coup de gras, but leading up to that, he would rape them, full on rape uh, from the backside. Um, oh, yeah. And um, then to finish them off, he would use. A um, a rope and tied around their neck, and then the other part of the rope he would tie it around a piece of wood or like a wood stake, and then begin to twist the stake to uh, slowly to where the rope would the the stick would go closer to the back of the kid's head. The rope would tie tighter as he's turning it to where the stick is in the back of the kid's head and by his neck, and as he's twisting it, it's choking out the kid at the same time. So a slow strangulation. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah. Oh, he's gross. Yeah, this was this is what he did to um, John. Uh, uh, what was it? This is what he did to the first victim. I'm sorry, Timothy. Um, and then they think that that happened to the second kid as well, because most of the bodies they found, uh, it appeared that they were strangled to death. You know, uh, outside outside God. of the, outside of the first victim actually that was stabbed, the Greyhound bus. My bad. Um, mm-hmm. Most of the victims after that were all you know, mostly str- strangled and tortured in various, various violent ways. And they were also raped. So that's, that was, oh. his, that was his MO. So inflicting pain, rape and strangulation. What a pig. Yep. Yeah, dude. And, and like you said, you say he was already a big guy and, you know, he's targeting teenagers. Mm-hmm. They really, and then they're handcuffed. They really don't have a chance. Yeah, they, they don't at all. So these these guys were unfortunate, you know, these kids unfortunately f- uh, fell to the hands of John Wayne Gacy, and uh, so victim number three, we'll move on to him. It's uh, John Bucevich. I think he was a Polish kid. Uh, he was an 18 year old employee of John's contracting company. Uh, Bucevich would leave his family's home in downtown Chicago, July 31st, 1975, heading to Gacy's house. The poor young kid uh, said, I just want to quit the contracting company because I'm going to go to Lane Tech College. And he was there to pick up the money that John Wayne Gacy had owed him for the uh, final two weeks. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, he would never leave the house. He would suffer a similar fate as victim number two, almost to the T. The problem with this victim, as described by John Wayne Gacy himself in his testimony to police later, Bucevich's body would leak many fluids. So he did a lot of things to this poor guy. Um, Mm. He killed him. And this is where this taught him a lesson to where, okay, if he's going to be leaking bodily fluids, blood, other things, it's going to leave a smell. It's going to come through the house. So he decided to then use socks, towels, napkins, and um, little small rags to shove shove those into whatever holes or um, wounds that he had to 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 keep the bodies from leaking. So he's like plugging the holes literally with. Oh my god! Yeah. So he wasn't exactly wrapping them up in plastic sheeting yet. So he he was using this so that they wouldn't leak because he figured maybe I could put them upstairs in the attic, but then it would leak mm-hmm. the floorboards and the wood and come through the ceiling. And so he's he's thinking all this out. You know he's. For whatever reason, then he's like, "This is my plan. This is what I'm gonna do." So, yeah. Mm. So, because uh, Bucevich disappeared, going to see John Wayne Gacy about the money, the family contacted the police and said of of his last known whereabouts were at John Wayne Gacy's house. The police would come down that very next day, and uh, they say to John, "Get uh," and, and they would say to John, "Hey, what's going on? We had a tip that um, the missing the missing young man came to your house." 
John would give his similar testimony as he did to the police in prior times, coming off as a pillar in the community and an outstanding contractor with nothing to hide. The police searched his house but found nothing, all the while they were walking over the area just underneath the house, which was the crawl space where there was now three bodies, including the boy that they were looking for, buried just below them. Wow. Yep. So despite not finding anything, this could have been a massive change in the entire case. Had they found the bodies, countless numbers of young men and boys would not suffer the same fate yet again after an, uh, another break for John Wayne Gacy had just occurred. Mm. So this is going to be a reoccurring theme, unfortunately. Uh, the many families and, and lives that were touched because the police did not follow up correctly in any of this stuff is just, it's its terrible. It's heartbreaking. What could have been? Yeah. Yeah. So... Because of this real close encounter with the police, <clears throat> we're going to get into a different um, part of the story, which John himself calls the cruising uh, years, where he did not uh, prey on, well, mostly did not prey on any of the workers at his um, at his uh, company. He, he just went cruising either the gay scene in Chicago or just looking for young men on the street, basically. Wow. Yeah. Um so uh, he would offer these boys and young men rides, drugs, alcohol, and he would come back to the house and, uh, you know, do the whole pogo routine. And he, he's, he just stuck with that. So let's go through some of the uh, we're going to we're going to go through the victims and talk about them and what happened. <clears throat> um, Francis Wayne Alexander, 21, who was raised in North Carolina, but lived in New York, moved to Chicago area February 20, uh, February of 1975. He marries, but soon divorces his wife, but no one hears from him afterward. Alexander's family uh, assumes that he wants to be left alone because of the pain of the divorce um, and don't file a, a missing uh, missing uh, person's report for like two weeks. Dang, mm. that's a long time. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, his body after the torture and rape would be found in Gacy's crawl space. So, mm. so you're going to have to keep up with these... Uh, these people right here. So that's another one. That's another victim. Well, that's Let's, four. Yeah, that's four. So we're going in order here of the years and when, when they took place. <laughs> and this guy was 21. That guy was 21. Yeah. Wow. Uh, here's Daryl Sampson, 19 years old. Not much is known of Sampson other, uh, or his uh, disappearance, but he was identified in March of 1980 when he was the next victim found in the crawl space. They went exactly by, um, by the, uh, the, the, decomposition of the bodies to figure out which ones were in in which and then also by the disappearances so they knew he was uh number five so mm. then there was samuel stapleton this this is heartbreaking only 14 years old uh ah. stapleton disappears during a walk home from his sister's uh chicago's residence house on may 13 1976 his mother and stepfather would report him missing the next day. Samuel's body would be found uh, in 1979 in a crawl space with a bracelet that his mom gave him uh, that was still on his wrist. Man. Yep. Um, the next body, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Randall Rafit, 15 years old. He was picked up by Pogo. So he was already the clown at this time, and he picked him up. Mm -hmm. He offered him alcohol, and uh, he was raped, tortured, stabbed m multiple times to the point of dying uh, but but here's the thing, Gacy kept him alive and would patch him up just to torture him some more before raping him and putting him in the crawl, crawl space strangling him oh. hey man, this dude's sick he's yep. trash he is <clears throat> the next victim is Michael Bonin 17 years old, uh, he had a fishing license in his pocket when he was found in Casey's house belonging to the Chicago resident, and it's the first clue to what happened to him because Gacy didn't have much to say about Bonin of his June 3, 1976 uh, disappearance. Michael had gone fishing in the area not too far from Gacy's house. John had either gone fishing and approached the young Michael and lured him into the car, or John had just intercepted Michael before he could make it back to his, his house, um, leaving the uh, the pond or the lake where, he was, mm -hmm. where the kid was fishing. Mm. 
Um, the next victim is 16 year old William Carroll um, from uh, Chicago. Uh, William Carroll had a history of getting into trouble and run ins with the police. So this was like a one of your typical teenager just rebelling, doing bad stuff here and there in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Um, he was really tight with his older brother, and he, he uh, his older brother's birthday was June 13th, 1976, which Williams di- William did not show up to. Uh, Carol had promised his father and his brother that he would return in an hour and and uh, he would get over there to his brother's house uh, to uh, celebrate his birthday because he was really tight with his brother. Mm-hmm. But he was seen by three or four other people in the area getting in a dark color car. And um, that dark color car belonged to Casey, but no one put two and two together. Nobody got a license plate. Mm. Yeah. And unfortunately... Man. Unfortunately, William was found in 1979 also in the crawl space. That's terrible. It's like you already know there's been many teens missing and you're not going to think it weird when it's somebody you know getting in a strange car. Exactly. And and we all know what Chicago's police force is today, the way they've been <laughs> defunded, the way that there's so many murders in that, st- in that state. Mm-hmm. The solve rate is so low. It's the lowest in the nation. Mm-hmm. Now this is 1979. Now again, police aren't the smartest. They don't have it, the 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 DNA and all that stuff. But just like Gabby said, there's multiple kids or young adults disappearing. Shouldn't the light bulb come on on one of these detectives and be like, hey, you know what? There could be something to all these missing mm-hmm. kids. You know, investigate. You know, do do something. You know, <laughs> do something. <laughs> the other guys are like, ah, the Bulls are going to be coming on, or no, the Bulls aren't good back then. It's uh, what is it? It's the Cubs. <laughs> Gotta watch the Cubbies. The Cubs, yeah. yeah, there it is. <sighs> yeah, that's unfortunate. But um, so the next, so many. You know what? From the first time when they investigated his house, right, or they went to his house, they mm-hmm. could have, they so many kids could have been saved. Yeah, because because after those three, I told you where they stopped, you know, to, to check out Bukjevic's body. Um, mm-hmm. What we were like six more in already, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I mean, this is this is terrible. So yeah, <clears throat> and here's another one. So one of the oldest victims was another white male, uh, still identified to this day. Um, he was five foot six. Uh, or five foot four, he's between five foot four and five foot six. He disappeared between the dates of June thirteenth, nineteen seventy six, uh, and and July of nineteen seventy six. He was uh, of the ages of twenty two to thirty years old. That's all they know oh, about the man. body. They still can't um, identify him. So wow, well, he was old. Yeah, he was older actually. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> here's the next victim, Jimmy Hankinson. Uh, a native of St. Paul, Minnesota, called his mother August 5th, 1976, to tell her that he had arrived at Chicago's Greyhound bus station. That was his last conversation. In, wow. In 2016, thanks to DNA, his body was identified as being one of the kids in John Wayne Gacy's crawl space. 2016? Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Hankinson was 16 years old. So you, this That's whole time, time, this whole time, mm-hmm. it took them what? That's what thirty years. That's uh, let's see, uh, I gotta do my math on that one. Seventy six, twenty sixteen. Forty years. That's forty years. Forty. 40 years. Dang, forty years later. Yeah, his parents probably passed away. Didn't even know who who killed their Man. son. What happened to him? Yeah. So. The next two victims are both identified till this day. The first one's a white male, 5'11 to 6'2. He disappeared sometime August of 76 to October of 76. And he was at between the ages of 19 and 21. Uh, he too was found the same way. The only difference is uh, at this time, with all the things that he does torture, rape, all that stuff, the strangulation he's now starting to wrap them up in plastic sheeting to, con- mm. to conceal the smell. Uh, the next victim is five foot eight to six feet. Uh, another white male disappeared August 6, 1976, or as late as October of 20, uh, 25th of 1976. He was between the ages of 21 and 27. 
Um, so as you see, the bodies are being racked up. John is going from one place to another, picking up victims at random. And the police are still not putting these all together as one big disappearance or as a serial killer. Man, I, I, you would think he's probably using a different method by now. Mm-hmm. You know, the handcuff trick probably ain't getting all of these guys. So I wonder how he is luring them in. <clears throat> well, I mean, if I think he drugs and alcohol are, are his biggest keys. Oh, right yeah, away. that's true. You know, and, yeah, yeah, and that's right. Money or whatever. He's 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 going with his go tos and they're working. You know, somehow he's getting these these boys to come back to the house and stuff, and it's just it's unfortunate. So many have fell uh, fell for it, you know. And now he's racking up. We're at thirteenth, so it, it's like a drug to him. You know, he ain't been caught. He's getting his high and his pleasure. And yeah. Jeez. Now there are two local reporters that actually raised the question that back when media was non-biased they actually were like hey you know what um we're gonna write a story about there's a rash of missing kids in the chicago area the response of the police chief will get you more mad so the police yeah the police chief was asked uh you know what's going on uh, with all these missing and abducted uh you know teenagers and young men and, and granted, it's not like these are minorities either. So you would think back then, I know it sounds bad, but the police didn't take minorities missing. For those outside of the country and don't know how America works, they didn't take minorities be- missing as a serious thing. Absolutely. If you were white, it was right to investigate. And that's Absolutely. unfortunately how it was. And every one of these victims is white. So that's another question mark of, damn, Chicago's really lazy. Yeah, like, they must be really would, lazy. And, and you know, it's funny. I was just about to ask you. It seems like, based off of the names, it, it appeared that they were all white. Yes, they were all white. So you wow. would you would think back then, you know, being a little bit more racist or biased in any way you want to talk about it, mm-hmm. that the police would have made a bigger effort or a, or a faster effort on trying to investigate these, and they di- they just didn't. Wow. the The police chief was quoted as saying, "This is a huge city." People go missing all the time, and they they somewhat kind of wind up in places where you don't think they'd be, but they come back. So we can't we don't have the time or the manpower to like look after everybody. <laughs> Why he got a southern accent in Chicago? He, he transferred from the south. That's right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what what kind of response is that though, man? That's a. I like donuts and coffee and staying at my desk. Dude, like, come on, man. I mean, look, people do come up missing. I get it. But to say that's insensitive. It is very. And so repeat what he said. I had to take a potty break. (laughs) Oh, no. He he basically told every uh, told the newspaper that everyone uh, you know, you, they can't keep tabs on every everyone that just disappears. People usually come back. You find them in different areas, or or they just want to get away. Like he had an excuse for everything. He was just dancing around it. He didn't want it. He's he didn't feel that there was a rash of missing and exploited teens and adults. Wow. Mm. Yeah, man. I, uh, yeah. What an idiot. So so two days later, after that's printed. You know, you would think maybe that would raise awareness. Maybe the police hit the street uh-huh. a little harder. Rick Johnston, 17 years old from Bensville uh, High School, uh, was dropped off in the Chicago area by his parents to go uh, attend a school dance on August 6, 1976. In this instance, John was actually dressed as Pogo and lured John, or John lured uh, him into the car of promises of weed and beer and a party back at his house, which he has said other kids would be attending. But Rick Johnston fell for this, and Rick Johnston paid with his life and torture for over four and a half hours. Wow. Before uh, John finally uh, strangled him to death. Tortured for four and a half hours. Yep, yep. Can't imagine what that poor young boy went through. Man. Yep. So the he next probably one probably wished he would die in the middle of that, and he wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, he was going to be kept alive by, um, by the by the creep as long as he possibly could. So that's terrible. 
Um, the next victim was William George Bundy. He was an accomplished 19-year-old diver and gymnast from his local high school and attending a, a community college. He tells, mm-hmm. his, he tells his family members he's heading to a party on October 19, 1976. They notice he leaves his wallet behind and uh, at, the, at the house when they went to look for him a few days later. 35 years it took for the Cook County uh, Sheriff to um, confirm that his DNA through a cousin and uh, he was one of the bodies buried underneath John Wayne's uh, crawl space. Mm. How old was he? He was 19 at the time, and uh, it took a, it took 35 years to find out that he was under John Wayne Gacy's uh, crawl space, and also uh, because these bodies are badly de- decom- decom- decomposed. Yeah, decomposed. So All these bodies fit under there. Like, That's what I'm saying. It's like in the whole bottom of the house. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because he was. How the heck did he get them in there? I'll, I'll explain that as we move forward. Because I was wondering that too. I said, okay, a crawl space now. All right. How do you fit all them in there? Yeah, because a crawl space, if you think about it, under a house, most of the time is about two to three feet high. You mm-hmm. know, uh, about that, maybe even four feet, not too big. So you can't stand up in there. No, you know, not, not at all. Yeah, you got to literally, it's called no, a crawl space for a reason. Crawl. <laughs> yeah. So. We'll we'll talk about how that was put together. Okay. Um, so let's keep going now because we got more people to talk about, unfortunately. Okay. Um, then there is Michael Marino, who was 14 years old, a longtime friend of Kenneth Parker, who was 16. Is last seen on October 24th, 1976, near a restaurant at Clark uh, Street Diversity Parkway. Now, Clark Street Diversity Parkway is going to turn into a spot where he just regularly picks up kids and young adults. So it's going to okay. be. It's so this is making the job for the police a lot easier had they did that one thing we talked about investigate because mm-hmm. that's where most of them were disappearing from mm-hmm. and they never and they failed to investigate that part so uh, Kenneth Parker and Michael Moreno were best friends unfortunately at the same time they went with uh, John Wayne Gacy and they were never seen again. Again, two people from the uh, diner would later later tell the police that they saw them getting into a black car, but did not catch the license plate. Again, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. these and these kids would not be um, their families. What was left of them at the time would find out forty years later as well in two thousand sixteen that the the two best friends were found under under his house as well. Wow. And the thing is, they they both suffered the same fate. This was the only opportunity or instance that he took two victims at the same time. Mm-hmm. It is not known how long he held either one of them, but it is known that he kept one of them alive. Um, for he did mention he kept one of them alive for a longer uh, extended period, but he didn't tell the police how long. And but he did say he did a lot more different things to those two kids. So, wow. So what do you guys think of this guy so far? Uh, Scum. <laughs> yeah, took the word right on my mouth. Mm-hmm. I mean, this that guy. Is so sad to just. I mean, they're, they're all sad. It's all jacked up. But for two to go together and see what's going on with each other and not being able to do anything. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. That's yeah, man. Harsh. So this next one's going to kind of piss you off too. Um, the victim is Gregory Godsick. He was 17 years old. Uh, this one's a little weird because he was a high school senior. He would tell his girlfriend that he's going to John's house to help him dig some uh, some holes for piping under his house. Mm. So and this is true. Gregory does go to the house, and he does um, uh, work for John in the crawl space. Now, how he didn't see the bodies, I don't know, but he basically dug his own grave. Oh, uh, yeah, as soon as he got out of the hole in the crawl space, John would take uh, Gregory, knock him over the head, uh, and then get him either tied up or in the um, handcuffs and begin to molest, rape, uh, abuse everything, and then before strangling him and putting him in the hole that the uh, young boy dug for himself. This was something that wow. yeah, this was something that the police thought that it was outside of his mo that it might have been something to just float his boat and make him laugh. Like he's laughing the fact that the kid's digging his own grave. Wow. Mm-hmm. What a bastard. 
Yep, yep. So um, because, I can't wait till he gets caught. <laughs> so because Gregory uh, told his his girlfriend where where he was, the police and investigators would go to Gacy's house to interview him several times, and they would find no clues of Gregory's disappearance in his residence. Are you serious? Yep. Wouldn't you at this point, if the kid mentioned what he was going to do at his house, wouldn't you go see what work he did show us? Yeah. And then figure out something's not right in there? You would think. See, Gabby Gabby would have just been hitting these guys like, no, 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 no. We need to continue to investigate. You're you're not doing your job. They didn't even bother going in the crawl space whatsoever. Oh, man. Hmm. So they didn't find it. I mean, yeah. Hope all these people got fired. <clears throat> yeah, there was there was some stuff that took place afterwards that we'll get into. Um, so, and, and and they even the family of Gregory even hired a private investigator to watch John, but unfortunately they couldn't catch him in any criminal activity because he was on to someone following him. So he kind oh, of he knew. Yeah, he laid low until and of course you, private investigators aren't exactly cheap. So he laid low until that guy he felt that he was away from him and then he went back to his dastardly deeds mm. so the next victim is John Sizik. John's body would be found in the crawl space and uh, the only identifier to him was a class uh, high school ring that was still attached to one of his fingers uh, mm. Yeah, John who was 19 years old um, left his car at, at Gacy's house and Gacy decided to sell John's car to Michael Rossi who was Michael Rossi was an employee of his at the carpentry place, another 19 year old Rossi, mm-hmm. w- Rossi would get into uh, a uh, dispute at a liquor store, try to steal some beer. And then the police would catch up to him because, you know, stealing beer is much more, uh, m- much more a, uh, what do you call it? A crime than uh, missing exploited. Uh, mm-hmm. things. So they, <laughs> they caught the kid. <laughs> they caught Rossi for stealing uh, beer. And then when they uh, ran his license plate, they realized that the car was uh, registered to the missing Gregory fellow. And they were like, what are you doing with the car? And when they asked uh, Rossi what happened to the car, he said, I got it from John. And the police were like, didn't we interview him about Gregory? And they went back to uh, they went back to his house and they're all, what are you doing with a missing young man's car? Then selling it to another man that we just arrested. And then uh, to this, John Wayne Gacy said, well, he had to leave town and he needed some money. And he said, you know what, officer? He goes, uh, or, or, you know what, John, can you can you buy this car for me? And I said, well, I don't need it, but I can give it to another one of my employees. I'll give you a couple thousand for it. And then the police looked at each other and they're all, all right. And they left. <laughs> oh, dear. Don't tell me that. Got He got away with that. He got away with that one, too. What? Yeah. They're just they're just not okay. even okay. You know, go ahead. Okay. Now I know I'm not the expert here when it comes to detective work. You two are. But uh, clearly I would have been interviewing and asking some questions because I came to your house earlier for a missing person. All right, you know. Mm-hmm. Now you got another missing person's car and sold it to another person. I would be asking a lot of questions now. Yeah, too many missing people linked to you. What's yeah, it's going too on? many missing people linked to your name. And here's here's the worst part about this too. <clears throat> okay, because I understand you didn't have a data, database, but you could have made some phone calls, looked his social security number up. He was at that time still on probation from the other stuff, you know, from the, the attempted rape and the, the uh, you know, the child Mm -hmm. and you know what he did to that kid forcing him Mm -hmm. you know and kind of like holding him against his will that all would have gotten him back thrown into jail too and Mm -hmm. and they they just didn't look into any of this stuff and so like the 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 kid that's missing you have his car and and, you know he was last seen digging at your hole how come you didn't tell the uh, or at your uh crawl space how come you didn't tell the cops hey you know what i have his car you know he sold it to me you didn't mention that before when we asked you and again, the cops are like, "Well, sounds about right, Johnson. Let's move on. We got other things to do. They could be stealing. They could be stealing some Paps Blue Ribbon down the street. Let's go." 
these dang <laughs> ran away kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. These youngsters. <laughs> so yeah, goodness gracious, man. So many opportunities. Yeah, and it just continues, and it's just so sad. So <clears throat> wait, so, there's more. Yeah, there's more. There's more. So again, another opportunity where they could have stopped the killing, and the killing just continued. So without any follow-up, he's free to do whatever he wants. And, um, you know, the, uh, the young men were, were cut down. Young kids that did not deserve the fate that they, uh, that they endured, the torture, rapes, beatings, strangulations, a hand at the hands of this big monster. So the next one that would suffer the fate is John Prestige. He was 20 years old, grew up in Kalamazoo, Michigan. He came to visit a friend. So he's not even familiar with Chicago. He came to visit a friend and a co-worker who was a co-worker and contractor working for Gacy. After one of the meetings at uh, that Gacy had held at one of the restaurants near downtown with all his employees, that kid that came to see one of his, uh, his employees would disappear that same afternoon and he would wind up in the crawl space. Mm. So he killed one of his co-workers, uh, good friends that came to see one of his co-workers. That's crazy. Um, Another unidentified victim was another white male, 5'7 to 5'11, disappeared somewhere between March of 1997 and July of 1977. Uh, he was found, too, in the crawl space, so he's still unidentified to this day. Uh, Matthew Bow Bowman was 18 years old. Crystal Lake, native of Chicago area, was reported missing by his sister July 5th, 1977. His body would not be identified till January 27, 1979. Then you have Robert Gilroy, 18 years old, a son of Chicago police sergeant. So this is a police sergeant. Oh, wow. Kid. Yeah. Uh, Gilroy tells... Now they might work. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Matt, right away. <laughs> he says that right away, like in a cold-blooded... Like, yeah, now they might work. Because <laughs> that's what happens, remember? Only if it involves the police kid, they all take it seriously. Yep, but, but they don't. Hmm. Gilroy tells his parents he's going to a horseback riding um, class in Academy because he wants to be, I guess, something to do with horses. He wants to be a professional something, rather. And, okay. you know, they have kind of money, so he's leaving town September 15, 1977. Oh, well, that one. <laughs> yeah. He never, he never made it to his scheduled lessons when they called two weeks later to figure out where he was at. And he was missing since uh, he was missing on, uh, well, reported missing September 27th. And uh, since he believed that they traveled to Maryland for special classes, the investigation took the police outside of Chicago, thinking that he already left Chicago. So they were looking back east. They weren't looking in Chicago for Gilroy at all. Wow. Mm. And Gilroy lived just four blocks from John's house. Mm. Yep. <clears throat> Another one is uh, John Malroy was 19 years old. He had just completed 18 months in the Marines and was going to be shipped off in a couple weeks. But he returned to Chicago in 1977 to visit family. The last time he was seen alive, he was at his family's house, September 25th, 1977. Unfortunately for the Maori family, it was the second tragedy in just years. With him disappearing and winding up murdered later, his sister was murdered in an unrelated gun, uh, gun case six years earlier. Oh, that's sad. Wow. Yep. So they lost both kids. Both kids murdered. Mm-hmm. Wow. What are the odds of that? <sighs> I don't know. That's Chicago for you, so maybe they're higher than usual, even back then. I see. Yeah. So uh, Russell Nelson, 21 years old, engaged in a University of Minnesota student, calls his mother to wish her happy birthday on October 17, 1977, he has never heard from again. Nelson's mother says her son came to Chicago with another young man to work for a contractor. Seem familiar? Mm -hmm. uh, an employee. Yeah, he was. He was. He came down. He told. He told his mom that you know when he wished her birth, uh, happy birthday. Hey, I'm going to Chicago. I got a real good job coming up. Never made it. Wow. Because the contractor was Gacy. Um, Robert Winch, 18 years old, from Kalamazoo, Michigan. He was also on his way to work uh, for the new uh, contractor in Chicago. He was last seen on November 7th, uh, November 11th, 1977. So again, another employee. 
that was you know gonna be working for um, John disappeared murdered mm-hmm. same way this is insane we're already at victim 26 mm-hmm. it's, and it's continuing yeah. oh my god Tom, Tommy Boiling the married father of a three year old son 20 years old disappears November 18th 1977 from a Chicago home Boiling Sisters uh, tells reporters that he was using drugs at the time of his disappearance. Either way, John uh, John uh, around, well, John picks up um, the man and uh, did what he did to the others, and he's never seen from again. Wow. David Talzma, 20 years old. Uh, Are a, you serious? Yeah, it continues, man. Unknown Chicago resident was doing uh, what uh, doesn't know. They were unknown what he was doing prior, but December 9th, 1977, his body uh, wound up in the crawl space, and it wasn't discovered till 1979, which would have been his 21st birthday, by the way. Oh, man. Yep. Then you have William Kindred, William's girlfriend, Mary Jo Paulus, who met Kendrick when he picked up picked her up, um, and her friend was while hitchhiking on the way to the north side in 1977, was missing... Um, was a missing and he fails to arrive at her house at February 16, 1978. Police would uh, find out that he was also picked up on Diversity Parkway, but no additional evidence was found. Another frustrating part, like I said earlier in this case, is so many of them were picked up on Diversity Road, but no one decided to freaking look into any of this. And no one decided, mm. hey, you know what? Maybe we should put a stake out here, see who comes around. Yeah. Yep. How old was this one? Uh, this guy was 20 as well. Mm. My so, thing is, are they being gagged? No, he's... he's. Uh, well, it's funny because you, you get to this one right here. The next one is a little different from the other ones. But for the most part, he's just enticing them by either weed, alcohol, um, you know, fun parties or whatever like that. And they're just going along with them. No, but my thing is, while they're being tortured... Do, do he has like a gag uh, you know those little uh, gagging things where well, they can't scream he never really says so I'm not sure I know his house wasn't soundproof so he had to use something Whether, he had to have it cause, yeah. nobody didn't hear anything yeah because his house if you look on the on, uh, maybe I'll post a picture too of his house it's like suburbia Chicago it's, so it's not like a rough area it's somewhere where you could probably hear it I mean these are older style homes mm. so he has neighbors yeah, he has neighbors, yeah. What in the world? Yeah, he's he's got neighbors, and people are still disappearing and stuff. So. You see someone come in, and you never see them come out. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Where are all the nosy neighbor women that should be around? <sighs> they should be there, but they're just not. And uh, wow. because, because of that, here's another guy with it. And Matt brought up a, you know, how's he, well, he, he talked about gagging in the in the car or in the, in the house, but here's a different way. He actually used chloroform for this kid. Oh, wow. Yeah, Louis Reno did not exactly want to get in the car, so he kind of fought uh, John Wayne, but at this point, he pulls out the chloroform and rubs it on his face and knocks him out within seconds. And again, two people saw, <clears throat> including a third person, saw this argument and a fight, and they said it someone just pulled someone in the car and took off and uh yeah nobody would um see him or they didn't get the license plate and uh with this one was different too because louis used what we talked about and i forget what episode it was with the uh the candy man where he mm-hmm. had like that torture board mm-hmm. well he pulled out a torture board for this guy and he tortured him methodically for f- uh, four and a half almost five hours mm before giving him a, a similar fate. Now, the thing is, though, about Louis, is that Louis would actually get away. What? Yeah. Here's even here's, after the torture. Yeah, even after the torture, what happened was, uh, at the time, Gacy is running out of a room in his crawl space, so we were going to eventually get to that. And and he's trying to find a place to put him, but he's like, you know what? He, I think he's already dead. He takes him to a Chicago uh, park and just drops him off. So he's bleeding from his rectum. He's bleeding from all puncture wounds. Uh, he's been, uh, what is it, shocked. All kinds of torturous stuff, uh, bitten all over. 
and just left into a park. God, dog. He gets stumbles to a payphone where he calls his girlfriend. His girlfriend takes him to the uh, Chicago hospital, and he's kind of in critical condition, but when he comes out of it, the police are right there to ask him the important questions, and you would think, you would think at this time that uh, they are going to investigate and be like, okay, you know what? He, remember, he was chloroformed, so he doesn't know where he was taken, but he can describe mm-hmm. he, can, he can describe John. And uh, the police were like, you know what? You have a history with I mean, you know, alcohol and drugs, and again, they're holding that against the kid. And they were, and they were saying, uh, who would make, who would say stuff like this? You know, you probably just got into an encounter with a lover. He's like, I have a girlfriend. I'm not gay. This is what happened to me. Blah blah. And being that, if I was a cop, and back in the day where, you know, maybe now it's easier for someone to say, listen, I was raped by another man. Uh, you know, I'm a man. Blah blah. blah. Back then it wasn't. But you have someone that's actually saying, yes, I was raped back then. I mean, I would believe it more. You know, I'm just telling mm-hmm. you, you know. And uh, unfortunately, they didn't. And they wrote this kid. What? Yep. Yep. Not enough evidence. Hey, Not enough evidence. <laughs> that's what they said. Not enough evidence. Okay. He was tortured for hours. What more did they want? The man is bleeding everywhere. And mm-hmm. you're going to tell me not enough evidence. Not enough evidence. Mm. So. Look, man. So, I've done some drugs. I've done. I've drunk. You know, I've gotten drunk before. I have never been bleeding all over the place from those, you know, things that I've done. Uh, yeah, obviously. I mean, if they said, "Hey, man, uh, smoking smoking weed will cause your anal to uh, your your rectum to bleed," <laughs> you're gonna be like, uh, "No, nah, you know what? Maybe I'll I'll abstain. Maybe I'll pass." You know, yeah, yeah. like, yeah, that just pissed me off, man. Yeah, and he described parts of his house too he just said like i've never seen the guy before uh this this happened to me over on this street and even when he mentioned this damn street that he keeps picking people up on the police still don't tie it to to, to anything by far this was the worst policing in any case we've done do you agree i agree because i think yeah yeah what do you think gab I think so, definitely. I mean, there's been an extreme amount of chances for them to get this, and they're stupid. Like, they just, they don't care. It started with victim three. Yeah, yeah, it did. It's like, you know how you say, well, if if it adds up, you know, two plus two equals four, boom, bada bing, bada boom. These cops are like, well, one plus one equals three, so it don't add up. Let's move on. (laughs) I mean, I, I don't yeah, do don't a, get it, man. I don't do a good Chicago accent. I'm sorry. I remember this. Well, that sounded more Southern. I'm just... <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, they had a lot of transplants. That's all. <laughs> Honestly, look, even if the guy was gay, and even if he was forcing around with his partner, it's mm-hmm. still a crime what that person did to him. Yep, exactly. So how are you just going to sit back and do nothing? Like, oh, well, you were fooling around with your man. So there, you you got what you deserve. Like, what? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. It's it's very very frustrating, and <clears throat> so again that you know Louis was left out in the park. He got away. He was one of the very few. There was a couple other instances that John would say that there was uh, abductions or you know that he was trying to get other men and teenagers and they got away, but they never reported those attempted uh, things because again back in the day you don't want to talk about someone picking up on another man. It just was taboo. Really? Yeah, you're right. So you had that working working for John as well. So so uh, at this time, like I, I mentioned, there's a reason for him leaving him out in the park. The bodies were, get this, stacked three, um, three rows on top of each other. So the bodies are stacked up underneath the, the – yeah, they're, they're, they're just sitting underneath his house on top of each other, three high to the top of the floor or to where the floorboard starts for the house. Oh, man. Jesus. So he was shoving them in there, and because the bodies were decomposing, the smell was leaking through the plastic sheeting that he had on some of them, or they were leaking bodily fluids. The smell was starting to come through the house. Mm. So this is where he decided, you know what? <clears throat> I'm going to dump the bodies in the Illinois River. 
So all of them? No, he's gonna start his next victim. Oh, that's what. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So trust me, I know this sounds monotonous, but we're getting towards the end here. But this is the third version of his serial killer persona. He's now going to take the bodies to the Illinois River. <clears throat> so the first of these uh these bodies um, is Timothy Rourke. Friends say that Timothy frequently visited gay bars, which John was frequently prowling at night over on Diversity Way. Wait, 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 wait. Sorry. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay, so he's the new bodies, the new people he's getting, he's going to throw in the river. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Not like he was going to pull out bodies and throw them. Oh, no, because that that would be too much work for him. He's like, yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, he's like, did it? Did I tell you how uh, how hard it was to stick all those bodies down there? <laughs> he's, he's like, only one dug his own grave. All the rest I had to put. Yeah. So this guy was how old? Sorry. Oh no, you're good. Uh, this guy was. Let me see. He was 21. Mm. He frequently uh, hit gay bars. Um, his body would be discovered June 30th, 1978, near the Dam of Illinois, just three miles from where other bodies would be found. Um, Franklin Landahan was found in the Illinois River. He was identified as one of Gacy's victims due to some of the belongings still in possession as and kept for trophies that Gacy had at his house later on. Um, he, How old I, he? Uh, he was uh, 21 years old. Um, his his body was found with uh, bikini panties stuffed down his throat. So that's two, right? Yeah, it's another. Yeah, that's two in the river. Oh, uh, that's- the second body? Yeah, it's the second one. Oh, okay. And then James Mazar is the third one. He was 20 years old as well. He was also found in the river naked and uh, underwear shoved down his throat. Gacy would admit to dumping his body after he tortured and mutilated the young man's body. And he, and they Ooh. found they found a tattoo that said Mojo on his arm that Gacy literally said, I, I tortured this guy for a long time. He had a tattoo of Mojo on his shoulder. So he mutilated him before he was dead. Correct. He was cutting. Oh. He was cutting things off and everything. See, man, that is so bad. Yep. So finally, we get to the part where the carnage would finally start to come to an end. Finally. Yes. Um, Robert Peist would be his final victim, unfortunately. Um, he is a West Honor stu- uh, West High Honor student that works the night shift at a Nissan pharmacy in Des Plaines, Chicago. On December 11th, 1978, Robert is doing his normal duties, cleaning up the pharmacy aisles and putting things back. And John came in the store and looked over the boy, very menacing, you know, like just looked him up and down like he, like a man would look up and down a girl. Oh. Um. He told the, the owner, though, in a loud voice so that the young boy can hear, he says, man, I really give you credit. You're, you're hiring these young youth. He goes, the youth are our future, and the, the, we need to teach these kids good values. And you know what? I do the same thing in my company. He slips the, the pharmacy guy the card and says, we hire a lot of teenage boys and teach them the right values so that they can grow up and become master carpenters and help build this city. So he's giving them a whole, like, story. Mm-hmm. And uh, John would leave the the pharmacy. And uh, so the boy was a little interested because he's hearing, man, more money, this and that. You know, he's he's only 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, you know, he's got his first job and he wanted a Jeep. So John came in like towards the end of the shift again back into the pharmacy. And his mom was uh, waiting outside for him uh, in the car because she was going to take him home. Mm-hmm. And uh, John goes in there to pretend to buy something. And then Robert comes up to him and says, hey, uh, how much do you pay at that construction job? And uh, he's like, well, I paid this, this and that. He goes, uh, if you want to if you want to come, I could show you uh, what you would need to, to have. And this is this and that. And he goes, and I could take you home afterwards. Or uh, and he, and he goes, no, my mom's outside. And then uh, he said, well, if anything, look, I could show you some of the tools in the, in the back of the car and everything else like that, you know, like that you'll need to buy. To, to, to join the contracting company. So he said, okay. So he told the pharmacy, I'm off shift. And then he goes outside. He actually sees his mom and says, hey, I'm just going to go with this gentleman real quick. Uh, he's going to show me about maybe getting another job. And uh, the mom says, okay. So they go around the corner uh, behind the the, uh, the uh, pharmacy. 
His mom's out front, and that's the last time she saw him. Uh, he, oh, wow. He chloroformed the kid, and uh, he did all that disgusting stuff to him, and he would wind up in the Des Plaines River in Chicago oh. just two days later. Now, that's gonna, that would suck. That was nighttime? Yeah, that was at night. What so the like, hell's wrong with this mom? I have no idea. She didn't question it. Yeah. Are you just going to let your son go with a stranger instead of, okay, let me come with you, or I'll drive back there and meet you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know she she was tortured. Oh, yeah. She lived with that the rest of her life. Mm-hmm. Now, what happened was just five hours later, because the, the kid never came back, they had a very good description. Gacy left his stupid card there, too, so they knew who the who he was. Mm-hmm. And the police actually did this thing called investigating. <laughs> and uh, one of the investigators decided before they, you know, when, when, when they brought him in for interrogation to do some research on Gacy. And they found out about the uh, accusations by the Lewis family um, about former employees, the fact that he had a 10 year sentence in his uh, in the prior time. All this stuff started coming up. And uh, wow. Yeah, all, finally. Yeah, exactly. And so it took a few days, but on December 13th, just four days after um, young Peist was found dead, uh, they, they did a search warrant and uh, they found trophies and other things uh, related to the to the missing uh, uh, <clears throat> the missing kids and young men. So they're already like, well, he's responsible for some of this stuff for sure. They. Now, now, this part of the story, I have no idea why or how or, or just how you couldn't find anything. But they went into the crawl space and found nothing. Get out. They found a, a foul odor. What do you think they said? The house was rotting. The Probably pipes. a dead bird or something. <laughs> a dead ro- rat. There's a leak. <laughs> Yeah, Gabby was right. the 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 police the police said to themselves in Chicago accents, which these aren't. Hey, Bob, it smells rotten down there as hell. It smells like something died, came back, died again, came back, died again, and came back and died again. I don't want to go down there. Do you? Nah, it's it's probably a broken pipe, leaky sewage. You know how that stuff happens. It's winter time, or no, no, no. It froze up in winter time and cracked, and then it leaked. Right? Yeah, let's write that on the report. Okay, all right. And that was about it, huh? That was it. So, so um, you're telling me that they found not one body, not one body, because wow. they, they they failed to go in deep enough. That's all I can think of into the crawl space area. And get this, they let him out on bail. Oh, wow. oh are you kidding me? They let him out on bail despite him having things that linked him to the bodies. Or, or to, uh, linked him to the the ones that were missing anyway, not yeah, the, the ones of the river. I mean, I mean, come on, you had enough on on Peist. The kid was missing. You, he literally picked up the kid. He was he was the last person seen with him, and he still got out. And this is why, till this day, Chicago has a high crime rate. Yes, and the only reason here is the only reason why they got this case solved. Because they put surveillance on him 24-7. He couldn't take a dump without them knowing about it. They would knock on his doors. They would look in his windows while he was there. They followed him to and from work. He could not shake them for anything. And it was causing mm. it was causing him mental stress to where he took off days from work. He was smoking like a, a chain smoker, which he never smoked before. He was drinking. He was just losing it because he, he felt eyes on him at all times. Mm. So... <clears throat> Finally, they interviewed uh, Rossi, that kid that he sold the car to, mm-hmm. and and he later would say, "Hey, man, I had to dig a lot of holes under his crawl space at times." And they were like, "Wait, you dug holes down there too? We heard about a, a victim that dug holes down there and never came back." And they're all like, "Did he ever try anything with you?" He's like, "Well, he did come on to me a couple times, and he tried wrestling me, but I just thought he was just a little weird, you know." And, and then they're like, mm. "So." He basically, then, then, the, then the police were already getting ready to move in before he literally cracked. 
John Wayne Gacy, December 28th, 1978, went to his lawyer's office and surrendered to police. Uh, Gacy cracked and confessed to 33 murders. Wow. Yet there's 34. Yeah. Well, one he's not claiming. Mm. Uh, Gacy went through a, through three hours of mental or mental evaluation, 300 hours, I'm sorry, of mental evaluations to see if he was competent to stand trial because he was trying to use the whole defense that he was innocent uh, by reason of insanity. Um, but despite this, though, the judge and the court found that he was competent due to the way that he treated his victims, the way he was methodical in hiding the bodies and being able to go back to work like nothing happened and working with kids, which disgusted everybody, and to cover up his crimes. So the trial, at trial, he was found guilty of the murder of 12 of the 33 that they found. They didn't find the 34th. Uh, they got the stick on him because the other ones, only 12 of the 33 that they found were identifiable. So that's the only reason why they charged him with those murders. But 12 was good enough to give him the death penalty. Good. So while in, while he was incarcerated on death road, uh, John Wayne Gacy painted himself and other pictures of clowns, which sold for big money, but he was not able to recoup the money to, uh, to the laws uh, of not being able to profit from murder and things like that. But a lot of these paintings were uh, in 1994 bought up by a Chicago businessman. He bought 21 of the paintings that from other people and private collectors and had a public burning in downtown Chicago to burn the uh, pictures that he said did not deserve, uh, that weren't honoring the victims of this monster. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Good. So on May 10th, 1994, the monster finally paid for his crimes as he died in the prison on death row by lethal injection. And the police themselves would go through a, a really a big time reform in 1982, uh, as the case was winding down, they wound up finding out that the police dropped the ball several times, refused to investigate, and could have saved countless lives of young men and kids, and that they decided to and were lazy. Several sergeants and higher-ups were fired. They basically redid the Chicago Police Department in that area. Good. So that's the story of John Wayne Gacy. You know, those stupid cops still lived long enough with their jobs for the dumb mistakes they made. Yeah, yeah. It's unfortunate. I mean, your, your guys' thoughts on everything? My thought is this guy was just, just sick. And, you know, unfortunately, the first two victims, you know, he got away with. The third one where... He the police could have found them under the crawl space, but they failed. You know, you take that oath, man, and you just gotta, you just gotta honor it, man. They they just were lazy, and it pissed me off, man. Because thirty four victims. That means thirty one extra kids, and or well, not just kids, but boys, men, were murdered when they could have been saved had they investigated the crawl space in the first place. I, I totally agree. I mean, the countless amounts of family, families that were um, affected, and there's still families out there of six that don't even know that their you know, loved one died in that way or fashion. They have no idea. Yeah. So it's just incredibly sad. And, and yeah, it made me mad too when I was reading how just unbelievable un unbelievably unprofessional these police were and the detectives and then the fact that you know these guys didn't face any jail time the police exactly they yeah. should have been not just fired but thrown into jail something but there was nothing they weren't held, held accountable other than if they have a conscience that'll weigh on them but that's about it that's about it they're probably dead by now most of them yeah and another thing too you know, of course he deserved the death penalty. But if I was the one, you know, euthanizing him, I guess, oh. I would have been uh, missing his vein a few times. Mm-hmm. 
you know, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't get the right I would have been missing his vein a lot. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't get the vein. Man, hey. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's just crazy. I mean, like, nobody nobody saw, nobody saw or investigated. I mean, I'm still baffled how you can't, even though you smell that rotting flesh or, or you think it's something else, I mean, you being a detective or police, you know the difference between a dead body smell and rotting sewage. How do you, how do you still not just go down there and be like, you know, I have a feeling about this. Let's check this. Exactly. Or when you came to his house the first time, mm-hmm. you know, like, come on, man. Even if you think it's sewage, at this point, it is your job to check everything. Yep. I don't care if you're puking or you have to wear a freaking mask. Get your butt under there and check. Yeah, because for me, I mean, look, I would if being a policeman back in seventy eight or seventy nine, I'd been like, you know what? What if this guy is a serial killer? I'm gonna be famous, you know. I'll throw on something, and no, even, what? even just as an ego, you know, I'll go down there. I'll be like, I'll find these dead bodies, you know, like. <laughs> but you know, but no one even thought that they were like, nah, it's just too too small of a crawl space, you know. They just didn't, didn't go after it. Thirty four <laughs> Caucasian men. Young men, mm-hmm. that's that's unheard of. Like, let's be honest. That's you know, you don't really see that unless it's like a war or something. Yeah, or it's a, like a mass shooting or something. A like mass that. shooting or something. Yeah, something like that. But I, I'm sh- surely, I am very shocked how many victims he killed, and I feel bad for them to be tortured like that, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's bad no matter the race. It's just like we were talking about, like, if you think about the time period these things took place, you would have thought the police would have been more along the lines of, you know, because that's what's even said to this day. They they say that minority women cases aren't, you know, put to the the top of the list for more white women. And that's how it was back then with men. They weren't taking the minority seriously, but the white men, yes. So, again... Where was that in Chicago? If if you're if you're gonna say okay, let's play the card at the time. Not saying mm-hmm. it's right. Not saying it's right at all. So I don't want no feedback on that. But I'm just saying, <laughs> right. if you're gonna play that card back then, where the hell was that? They could have stopped this monster. Yeah. And that's exactly what he was, a monster. Yep. And he he was he's a big intimidating guy, for a clown. You know what bothers me? A lot of these freaking murderers that they're going to go to trial always want to claim to be insane Mm -hmm. and they actually let them go through with that I mean although most of them they've been considered not insane and they pay the price but for them to even have a right to say that how how is it that you're insane then if you had conscious enough to say oh let me come forward because I feel really pressured now for everything I did and and people are on me, I might as well confess. If you're insane, you're probably not going to think that way. It's going to be whatever to you. Mm -hmm. Your brain is wrong. Yep. And for him to be granted bail, it's like, come on, dude. Yeah, I didn't get that one either. I mean, God, you have freaking stuff from missing people. And like Gabby, Gabby said, like, it took 300 hours, really? to figure out that he's not insane. Like it would have took me like a half hour. <laughs> you know, like yeah, he's not 20 insane. minutes. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, think about just the I mean, this is, I mean, I thought the worst one was the one I think we did the motorcycle shop murders. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How bad those cops were with the DNA and stuff. Mhm. Nah, this one. This one takes cake. Easy. Yeah, big time. Easy. It's going to be a it, we're going to have to really find a messed up case to beat this one. As far as being the worst. Yeah, so far this one's uh, this takes the cake as far as the worst police work. Yeah, in our in our in our little one year history mm-hmm. of doing this. So they weren't police at heart. No, they just had the badge. And I apologized earlier when I was doing the introduction. I said this is going to be the juicy part. Like I don't, you know, didn't mean to use that word. So my apologies. No, no worries. No worries. I mean, that is basically just another word for this is where we're going to find out. Like, you always you always say the meat and potatoes of the story. This is literally the meat and potatoes. Yeah. So, I don't want people to think that we are 
excited about murders and killing and stuff like that. So just want to get that out there. Yeah, because some people are sen- sensitive. They think they they uh, we've we've heard it in the comments that uh, some people like take things a little bit too much. That we're we're not condoning the death and laughing at it. We've never laughed at someone's death or anyone. It's always the policing or just stupid people in general. Yeah. So, with that being said, this is the end of the show. So this has been uh, Maddie Matt along with our narrator for today, Todd Fox. And the other host of the show, Gabby. And we are signing off. Toodles. Peace. Don't call me Colonel. <laughs>